Hello, very good evening everyone. My name is Bernard, I'm from UNOS College in Singapore. Today I'll be presenting on hand blocks structure editing for Cork. Hand blocks is a pedagogical tool intended to help beginners learn to write Cork proofs. But before we dive into that, let me give you some background. So what is Cork? The Cork Proof Assistant is an interactive theorem prover. This is an example of an IDE that we use to, prove, to write Cork proofs. On the left hand side, we have a proof written in Cork code Galina and LTAC tactics. On the right hand side, we have the hypotheses and goals of the current proof state. So Cork can be used for mathematical logic, but it, of course it can also be used to define functional programs and prove properties about them. So we've identified a few pain points of the Cork proof assistant. Firstly, the type system is complex and difficult to understand. Secondly, there's difficulty in learning new specification and tactic languages. Thirdly, there's friction in user experience. This friction is best illustrated via syntax errors. Can you guess what caused this syntax error? What about this or this? Maybe this will give you a better clue. Actually, all four of these syntax errors are caused by the same problem, which is missing the period at the end of a command or tactic. <laughs> Next, what is structured editing? Instead of user making low-level edits by directly editing the character by character, the editor helps them make higher level edits that require awareness of the syntax. One good example is Scratch, which is a visual block-based programming language editor intended to help beginners learn to program. The user can choose a block from the toolbox, drag it into the workspace, connect them together to build up their program. Two obvious benefits. Firstly, vocabulary discovery, because all of the available constructs are presented on the toolbox. Secondly, the, the code is guaranteed to be 100% synthetic correct. Synthetically correct. So, I present to you my solution, HandBlocks. HandBlocks is intended for undergrad students to experience his functional programming, but little to no experience in proving. And the use case is to learn, discover, and practice proving, and eventually transition to writing textual proofs with text, with text editors. It is an online web app that runs entirely in the browser without any server. Then the front end is built on Blockly, and the back end uses JS Corp. This is the interface. There are four panels. On the left hand side, we have the toolbox followed by the workspace, the code, and then the goals. Against the advice of everyone, I'll be giving a live demonstration today. <laughs> so as you can see over here, I have this partial proof proving that this function is commutative. So let me choose a tactic from this toolbox, because I already know I want to use the left tactic. And you can see that the code is immediately updated over here. I can step through the code via the buttons or keyboard shortcuts. You can see that now I need to prove Q, and I can use the exact tactic for that. And now I need to use the hypothesis HQ. And instead of typing out HQ, I can select from a drop-down list. And this list is populated by my program for all of the, all of the variables and hypotheses that are in scope. And what I mean by in scope, HP is not available in this branch. Only HQ is. That's why only HQ is here. Furthermore, this, this hypothesis H has been destructed and has been disappeared from the context, so it's not, not available. So this is my first advanced feature, variable drop-downs. Secondly, automatic renaming. Let's say I want to provide a more informative name. Let me rename this right now. Oh no, this is a different keyboard layout. <laughs> I don't know how to use this, never mind. As you can see, I've, I've changed it to something else. So this is automatic renaming, and uh, all subsequent usages will be uh, renamed as well. Thirdly, automatic slots for sub goals. So let's say that I have a data type that has three constructors, so I need three cases here instead. Let me add one more, and you can see my program has populated an extra slot because there are now three sub goals. So that was my third advanced feature. Now moving back to my presentation. Of course, there are a few limitations. Potential for visual clutter. Dragging and dropping is slower than typing. And there is limited vocabulary in what my program supports. However, I contend that these limitations are not as severe and are mitigated because handbox is intended for beginners. And these limitations are not that important when starting out. This is also because uh, hand blocks can be used perhaps in like the first few weeks of an undergrad class, and then after that, you can transition to proper IDEs and text editors. For future work, most top priority is user testing. Uh, this could be, for example, following uh, the undergrad students taking the COP class, or maybe AB as an AB study. Additionally, further development via uh, letting users to write the COP code and then generating the blocks from that. Thirdly, improving the user experience, but for example, customizing for teaching. Imagine uh, an instructor that teaches a COP class and they want students to only use these three tactics. Then they can customize it in the editor, and then students, when they use hand drops, they are constrained to only use these three tactics. 
To conclude, I've applied fully fledged structured editing to proof writing. We've developed some advanced structured editing features. Fully fledged structured editing is a promising approach to proof writing that warrants more exploration, development, and testing. These are my references and acknowledgements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was almost five minutes on the dot. Uh, so we have to move on to the next speaker, but I encourage you to seek out Bernard and ask him questions in the break. Uh, so the next speaker, if my memory doesn't betray me, is Eric Xiao, um, talking about uh, compiling functional programs with holes. Do these mics work? Hello? OK. Uh, This is kind of exciting. <laughs> there we go. All right, please. Hello, everyone. I'm a second year undergraduate at the University of Michigan. I'm presenting joint work with Hilbert Chen and Yanjin Chen on compiling functional programs with holes. Uh, so a little bit of context first. Um, we're doing this in the context of developing Hazel, which is a, for those of you unfamiliar with it, a pure functional programming language with typed holes. Um, and also a live programming environment. This comes in two parts. There's a structure editor that ensures that all edit states are well formed, so there's no syntax errors and things like that. And semantics provide both static and dynamic meaning to all edit states. Um, in particular, this means that we can actually evaluate incomplete programs or programs that contain holes in them. Um, so as an example, we have this example Hazel program that shows the quantity three plus four plus this middle gap is a hole, um, and then plus five times six. So we'll first do three plus four, that's seven. We'll try to add the whole. Um, and this gives us what we call an indeterminate result that is just seven plus whole. And instead of aborting execution there, we actually continue around the whole um, and then do five times six, which is 30. And then our final result is five plus whole plus 30. Um, so yeah, this is evaluation with holes. And so our work is exploring how we can compile Hazel into a format that might be executed faster. Um, this might be useful for programs with portions that are incomplete, but also portions that have potentially intensive computation. Um, and so we're concerned with efficient runtime operations and representations for holes, uh, as well as integrating into the live programming environment that is Hazel. Um, and for now, we're compiling the WebAssembly because Hazel is web-based. And then we're doing this through Grain, which is a functional language that targets WebAssembly um, and also provides some low-level APIs. And in this way, we're kind of focusing uh, mostly on the problems with holes and not uh, fun, com compiling functional programs. Um, and more broadly, we're exploring the design space uh, of this area. Um, and so one of the key challenges is that indeterminate results uh, are not values, and they're, they're kind of like this tree structure. Um, so they have very different behavior from the values that a traditional compiler might expect. Um, and so during runtime, we need to build these result trees. And then because we want it to be fast, we also want to minimize the overhead of dynamically checking if something is a value or indeterminate result all the time. Um, and so we have a specific memory layout for indeterminate results that fits into the existing runtime system uh, to take advantage of features like garbage collection. Um, to check if something is an indeterminate result, all we need to do is a simple tag check, and then we have a runtime library that defines how we compose these indeterminate results, like in the example that I showed. Um, and because we want it to be fast, we also would prefer that ideally when you're executing this program, the complete parts of the program uh, can use runtime, fast runtime primitives. Um, and so we perform a static analysis to determine whether or not um, an expression is guaranteed to be a value or an indeterminate result at runtime. So we define this notion of completeness, which has three options. First is necessarily complete. It says that this expression must be a value at runtime. There is necessarily incomplete, must be an indeterminate result. And then there's indeterminately incomplete, which says that we can't really know statically. Um, and this can arise in the case of failed casts and things like that. And we make this explicit in the type system of an internal language, which you can see here. It's represented by K. Um, the filled dot is necessarily complete. Unfilled is necessarily incomplete. Half-filled is indeterminately incomplete. 
um, and that's part of the type. Uh, so a couple of rules we have that kind of describe these, these, the type assignment for this language. As you can see, holes obviously are indeterminate results, so we say that they're necessarily incomplete. Numbers are necessarily complete. Um, and then we have this case complete construct that uh, takes a indeterminately incomplete scrutiny and does a dynamic check and branches based on that um, check. And then because the Hazel internal language has casting um, to deal with holes, for casting in our runtime, we are first using the type index embedding and projecting approach, uh, where casting to a, the whole type is embedding type information and then projecting uh, is to cast away from the whole type. And that can fail and produce a failed cast form, which is indeterminate result. Um, and in particular, you can see that the rule for projection produces something that is statically indeterminately incomplete. Um, and so this is still very early work, so we're still exploring options for pattern matching, for example, because in Hazel, patterns cont contain pattern holes. Um, more efficient casting through uh, a corrosion-based approach, which can, which can mitigate the exponential blow up that can come with uh, the embedding projecting approach. And also the integration to the live programming environment that I described before. Um, and that requires a few things. In particular, we're thinking about <laughs> handoff between the compiler and the evaluator, um, such as the user selecting which part of the code that they want to be compiled and executed quickly. And then we're also interested in proving that this compilation pipeline is in fact preserving the behavior of Hazel. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. All right. That was another one, five minutes on the dot, so well done. Uh, we move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Francis Rivaldi, talking about uh, typing recursive data structures of futures for graph types. Awesome. Uh, my name is Francis Rinaldi. Uh, I work under Stefan Muller, uh, and this is the work we've been doing. Um, to oh, there's a, um, so many of you may know uh, programs when they execute, they can be represented as a runtime DAG in their execution path, uh, where a node may only execute after its parents have uh, executed. Um, so this is for some simple examples. Here's some sequential code. Does A then B then C? Um, here it does A, then B, and C in parallel, and then it does D. Uh, so you, if you look at the graph, you can see it does A, and then it can go to either B or C, or you know, both at the same time, and then it goes to D. Um, so because these graphs depend on, and, uh, sorry, depend on runtime information, they can reveal a lot about runtime. And so there's many benefits to if we could statically determine these graphs. Um, the problem is that that is impossible because of variance in input, whether it be user input or you know, random variables. Um, so this led Muller to introduce uh, kind of the core of this uh, language, which is graph types, uh, which is a representation of all possible DAGs that a program can make while executing. And so the trade-off is that uh, it is weaker because it tells you less information, but you can determine it before the program runs. Um, there's an example. Here's a comp and add, which takes in two inputs and uh, creates a future for both, and then touches them, adds them together. Um, for those that who don't know, a future is basically an expression that uh, spawns a new thread and computes whatever is inside of it. And then later you can touch it to get the result. Um, so if you look at the type here, uh, it takes in two ints, uh, and then returns an int. And this g is the graph type, saying that this function makes a graph type g when it executes. And so this graph type visually looks like this right here, where the top node uh, it starts there, and then it spawns going to the left and the right, uh, new features, and then the main thread of execution goes down uh, at the bottom node, and the bottom node will uh, touch both features. Um, here is another function, make future list, uh, that is pretty self-explanatory, makes a list of futures. Um, so if you want to give this a type, uh, it would be you know the type of a list of futures. Um, first, in order to determine what that is, we need to look at the type of a future. Um, so in our language, uh, future not only has a tau, which is saying the return type of the future, but also has this u. This u is a vertex, which is a unique reference to the future in order to enable graph types to work. Um, therefore, because each vertex is unique, each type for each individual future is distinct. Uh, and that brings us to the problem with this original lambda g. 
uh, is that it didn't allow no, uh, recursive data structures of futures. The reason being that because each future has a different type, the list of futures would be heterogeneous. Um, and there is no method for iterating over vertices in order to allow this. Um, so we solved this problem in the Lambda G mu, uh, which is the new language. Uh, introduces vertex structures, which act as a vertex structure, as our data structures of vertices. Um, so yeah, now this is looking a little daunting. Um, this is basically the type of a list of futures. So there's three things going on here. First is the recursive binding to a variable alpha. Um, and what is alpha bound, or what is bound to alpha? It is the middle part, this long, in between the comma and the colon, or the semicolon. Uh, starts with a function, a type level function that takes in a vertex structure that is a stream of vertices. And it constructs a product type that is a future uh, at the, with a vertex that is the head of the stream and a recursive call, which is the rest of the list, uh, with, uh, applied to the, uh, the rest of the stream. And the third thing that's going on here is that this whole function is initially applied with the vertex structure, which is a stream that uh, the type is indexed with. Um, so finally, we can give this a type, um, and we can give this a graph type as well, more importantly. Um, so this graph type here, it starts with the recursive binding at the very top, uh, and then the pi u is a uh, graph type function that takes in a vertex structure, which is the same stream, just as the type, and then it either goes down, uh, to the right is just saying, we're done making the list, to the left, it's uh, the right path on the left is saying, we're gonna make a future at the head of the stream, and then the left path is saying we're gonna call it recursively because uh, it's a recursive function and pass in the rest of the stream. Um, here is another example, uh, touch future list. It's very similar. Uh, instead of creating features, it uh, touches features. Um, so at this point, many of you might be wondering why this is a very specific problem. Uh, why was it you know, worth exploring? And to that, I do say it is a very specific problem, uh, but uh, kind of like as a motivating example, uh, made this function here parallelize, which takes in a list of any arity um, and parallelizes all of the work upon it. And so what it does is just uh, takes the list, put in a list of features that executes, and then you touch the list. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was the third in a row, five minutes on the dot. Very well done. Let's see if the graduates can do the same. Uh, so we move on to the graduate category now. And the first one there is uh, Nathan Coburn to talk about generalized free extensions. Hello. Hi. Right. Yeah, so I'm Nathan. And um, in case you haven't seen enough abstract nonsense this week, then I'm going to bleat about categories for a bit. But um, yeah, so. Free extensions, when you hear the words free extensions, it's everyone glazes over, but we're really just talking about open terms up to semantics. And by open terms, we mean expressions with variables and constants, but we're not cared about the explicit syntax, we care about the extension of this thing, what it actually means. Um, this is useful in all kinds of areas, right? Staged metaprogramming, you're producing code which might have unknowns in it. You might want to optimize that com computation. Partial evaluation, normalization by evaluation, reducing expressions to the most normal form, even in the presence of, of free variables. Also extremely useful for proof synthesis, proof by normalization. Normalize the left-hand side, normalize the right-hand side, see if they're equal. If so, you've got proof that the original terms were extensionally equal. Um, so these are all the applications that we're looking at. And at the moment, we focus on free extensions of algebras, right? We look at monoids, groups, rings. But what we're really interested in is free extensions of generalized algebras. These are algebras with dependently typed operations. And the point of my work is that this is actually new, and we need, we need to understand the universal property behind these generalized free extensions. Um, Here's a state of play at the moment. We've got a whole bunch of uh, generalized algebraic theories that we're looking at, categories, monoidal categories, Cartesian categories, have various applications in PL, and we're looking at formalizing and mechanizing all of these proofs in Agda, and I've covered categories at the moment. Um, so to get concrete for a minute, we've got a commutative monoid, say N+, plus, and we want to chuck in some free variables, X, Y, Z. Um, so we can build terms uh, in this in this world, like the one on, on screen now. Um, we build them using our binary operator, but we're allowed to draw free variables from the set that we started with. Um, scattered various here, and here's some concrete values, um, two and three. Now, when, when we actually look at, at, at this syntax, we don't, we don't care about its structure, because we, we know we don't need brackets, 
and we know we can commute as much as we like. So when normalizing, all we actually care about is how many times X appeared, twice, how many times Y appeared, once, Z, once, chuck it all in a bag and then pair it with the folded constant and you get a normal form. What we're really talking about though is how do we know that this is a correct normal form? We want a, we want a correctness condition for class of uh, n normal forms for uh, algebraic theories. Um, it turns out that this structure satisfies the universal property. I know eyes glazing, it's, it's fine. Honestly, we have a free algebra at the top, which is all the expressions we can build over the free variables. We've got the algebra of constants on the left, which we can include. Uh, and we get this new algebra of terms containing these expressions. And it just so happens that if you've done your job properly and you've constructed the algebra of normal forms, then for any arbitrary algebra W and a, a map from your algebra of constants into W and a map of uh, variables into W, there should be a unique way of reducing your term to an element of W. This is just a co-product with a free algebra. We've got a universal property. This is our correctness condition. Problem is when moving to generalized algebra, this breaks down. You start with a concrete category, so the category of finite dimensional real vector spaces, and you extend by some new free uh, unknown vector spaces, and then some linear maps. Here we've got F from R squared to X, a concrete space to a free space, G between free spaces, and H from a free space to a concrete space. Um, We've also got some type dependency here, and this is what makes this a generalized algebraic theory. F's type depends on X, which we've just introduced in our, in our context. So why are coproducts not good enough for this? Well, a coproduct of categories, you just paste their underlying graphs next to each other. How many maps in this picture go from R squared to X? Absolutely none, right? They're just side by side. So there's no way we can put our F in here. The observation is that we can pretend for a minute that the source of F was a free object that we didn't know about, and then we can quotient here and identify V1 with R squared. This moves our picture from looking like a co-product to looking like a restricted push out. So here we're just pushing out along the weakening, and gamma here represents our collection of supporting variables that we've chucked in in order to make delta a meaningful uh, extension of, of our constant algebra. Um, yeah, that's everything I've got to say. <laughs> Thank you. So this is exciting. We have time for one brief question. <laughs> okay, anybody dares to ask? Otherwise, we will move on. It, I can't see if there's any questions. That's too much light here. All right. I guess we'll move on. Thank you. So the next speaker is the Denis um, Kanye, who's going to talk about program logics for mechanizing type checking. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, for all the wonderful questions that I got yesterday on the poster session. I enjoy talking to very many of you. Uh, we've seen already a couple of really great uh, presentations. I did not put this much effort into my slides, but I will try to convey what I <laughs> wanted to talk about uh, today. Uh, so maybe I should say this too. Uh, I did this work at the VUB with uh, my advisor, who's a wonderful person who's here also, uh, Stephen Koichel. And uh, I've, I'm now starting a PhD at Guy Leuven as well because of this. Uh, so here's a slide from my um, motivation. This is uh, from a presentation that I first gave uh, 10 or so months ago uh, when I wanted to work on this uh, idea. And basically what I wanted to do is come up with this reusable method to do uh, executable, uh, monadic, mechanized, constraint-based type inference with elaboration. And over the last 10 months, I've worked with St Stephen a lot and. Uh, We've actually come up with a really cool way to do this. And did we get there is the, is the question, of course. On the programming side, uh, we came up with this interface in which you can express constraint-based inference. We did this for a very small language, which is STLC without typing annotation. Uh, I've sort of colored it in two different colors, uh, the first one in green. Uh, this sort of interface is enough to do uh, constraint-based type inference for STLC with type annotations. But when you let go of the typing annotation requirement, you need existential quantification because you need to uh, basically be able to express that you don't know what a type is in advance, but through unification, you will figure out what that type is. There's multiple different instances that you can derive for uh, an interface like this. And maybe uh, an easy way to think about the, the first three is as a, a, a writer monad where you 
just sort of uh, add type equalities as you come across them. Uh, once you add an existential, it becomes more complicated, and maybe the easiest way to reason about it is through the free instance. Uh, and, and both of these uh, instances actually give you a phase-separated approach where you actually can uh, sort of decouple um, constraint generation from uh, the solving parts. Uh, on the reasoning side, this was also mechanized in Koch, and um, there's a, a full proof uh, of the functional correctness of the algorithm um, in a shallow embedding setting, which I will get to in a bit. On the reasoning side, we uh, did this using predicate transformers. Uh, many people are maybe aware of uh, this sort of Hoare logic, or this notion of Hoare logic with Hoare triples. Uh, the problem with that is it's essentially a logic, which means you have to sort of come up with these uh, proof trees. A uh, much cooler way to do this, and I would really like uh, give a big shout out to uh, Dijkstra, who first came up with this in the 70s, is to use uh, predicate transformers, uh, where you can sort of, uh, essentially the, the way it's been taught to me is that it's a calculus, so you can sort of just compute the ultimate weakest, pre uh, weakest precondition for uh, your triples. And we realized this through a system of uh, syntax-directed reasoning rules. Uh, and basically, we can do the soundness and completeness proofs in about 15 lines of LTAC, where you basically say, try to apply all the rules, and at any point, only one of them will fit. And then you just apply that one until you get uh, basically trivial propositions to prove. Uh, there's a problem with the, with the shallow embedding that we used, which is basically that you're relying on the meta languages uh, functions to represent these unification variables. And so if you really want to say that you did um, type inference, then you sort of have to let go of the, um, the proof assistant itself. And so you need some symbolic way of representing unification variables. And the problem is that with that is that you have to now keep track of the scoping because you no longer have the functions in uh, the meta language that you're using. This is, uh, yeah, gets really hairy and really complicated, and the way that we figured out that we could do this is uh, possible world semantics. If you had the pleasure of uh, going to Steven's talk this afternoon, first session after lunch, then uh, he also talked about this. Uh, basically, we index um, types by world, which represents the uh, unification variables that are in scope to generate sort of constraints that are uh, well-formed and well-scoped by construction. And that's all I have, thank you. We, we have time for one question, if anybody has a question. Maybe to remove the glasses to see. I don't see any hands anywhere, no? All right, well, let's thank the speaker again. We'll move on. So we move on to the final speaker of the session. Uh, and that is, uh, who is uh, Arthur Corenzen, who's going to talk about formal verification of a lazy software model checker. Uh, so, hi everybody, uh, my name is Arthur, and I'm going to present my work on the formal verification of a lazy abstraction uh, model checker. So, so, what is a lazy abstraction model checker, first of all? Uh, so it's a methodology to automatically check that a program is safe to execute. And we do this kind of verification by exhaustively exploring an abstract model of the program. Such a model is hopefully much smaller and therefore much easier to verify. Um, what makes lazy abstraction model checking so special in comparison to other techniques to do that as well is that we can refine the model during the verification itself to make it more precise and conclude. How do we do that? So to build and refine a model of a program, we encode program states as first order formulas, and then we can build and explore and even refine this model by calling SMT solvers. One big limitation of this approach is that many issues um, are, we are facing many issues when we do that. So the first issue is, can we trust the result of the SMT solvers that we're using? And what if we made an error in the SMT queries themselves, the SMT queries that we're sending to the solvers? Um, moreover, to make that kind of technique scale to a large program, we have to use non-trivial optimizations that are really hard to understand. And for all those reasons, writing a model checker is prone to a lot of programming errors. To address those issues, what we would like to do is to develop a formally proved lazy abstraction model checker that is entirely developed in the core proof assistant. This allows us to write the code, the specifications, as well as the formal proof of correctness in one unified language. We can then extract the code code to correct an executable or camel code. Um, while doing so, we are mainly facing two big challenges. The first one is fighting with the proof assistant. 
Um, so yeah, Cork is a purely functional uh, programming language, uh, which is sometimes a problem. And it's also like a very strict setting where every function must terminate. Um, another big problem we are facing is that we need to verify uh, the integrated SMT solver. Why so? It's simply because uh, the um, correctness of the entire model checker strongly depends on the correctness of the SMT solver that we're using. The problem with that is verifying an integrated uh, SMT solver is in itself a difficult uh, research topic. So yeah, altogether, this is really not an ideal context if we want performance. So how do we solve those issues? So uh, to solve the first point, um, it turns out that we can formulate the model checking algorithm as a transition system, where the transition function is pure. Um, it makes the code easier to reason about. It also opens a lot of possibilities for efficient compilation. And on top of that, it makes it, 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 makes it easy to like force the termination by using the so-called fuel technique. So we iterate the step function for a fixed amount of uh, iterations. Um, now for the, very, uh, for the integrated SMT solver. So mainly there are two approaches that we can use. The first one is to just ignore the problem by saying, okay, we're gonna just use the SMT solvers as unverified oracles. And um, the remaining part of the model checker is still proved correct, which is already really interesting, but this approach is not completely satisfactory. So another approach uh, would be to adopt a very defensive style of programming where we don't trust the solvers and we systematically verify the solvers output at runtime. So these can be done by use proved validators that double check the results for every query that we send to the solver. And to do so, we could, for example, leverage the SMT Cog framework that already provides a set of very efficient validators for SMT solvers. Now the current state of the project. Uh, we do have a first prototype um, that uses SMT solvers as unverified oracles. However, the remainder part of the model checker is entirely proven in Cog. And this model checker is able to verify program safety for imperative programs with integer, ar integer arithmetic. And we also extracted these to executable OCaml and we can run it on small programs. Uh, now for future work, we really would like to extend the prototype to more realistic programs, also make it scale a little bit. And ideally we would uh, integrate uh, SMT Cog as part of the development. I thank you very much for your attention.